Hello and welcome to this part three video of my three part series on how to build a vocal booth. So today what we're going to be talking about is the acoustics of your vocal booth. If you haven't already go back to the first part of the series and the second part to understand how to build the isolation part of this vocal booth. All right. So before we jump in, I do want to let you know that I have a free resource for you. If you're going down this journey of trying to learn about room acoustics. This will help you out. It's very focused. There's a lot of junk on the internet. This is my free acoustic treatment guide, and you can download it right away at soundproofyourstudio.com slash acoustic. That is soundproofyourstudio.com slash acoustic. All right, let's jump into this lesson on how to acoustically treat your vocal booth. <laughs> Before we even dive in on how to do this, I want to give you a firm understanding of the limitations of a vocal booth from an acoustic standpoint to begin with. First off, smaller rooms, the physical limitations of the space mean that it's going to be harder to get a perfectly flat, full absorptive response in your room all the way down to low frequencies. With a smaller room, it's really, really hard to make it sound good because we inherently don't have enough space for the low frequencies to travel through the room, and we don't have enough space to incorporate the right types of acoustic treatment to absorb those lower frequencies. It's important to understand that the primary purpose of a vocal booth is not to get amazing, perfect sounding vocals. It's really just to isolate your vocal from the rest of the environment you're in. So I'm doing a vocal booth right now for a client who just sings metal music and he has a really loud voice and he's like, I just want to isolate my voice from the rest of my house. And I'm like, that's a perfect reason to build a vocal booth. And then I'm also going to acoustically treat that vocal booth to try to make it sound as good as possible. But he knows and I know that he's not going to get like the best sounding vocals ever. He would be better off recording his vocals out in his larger control room than he would in the vocal booth. But he wants to be able to sing to practice in the middle of the night and not bother anybody else. So that is the goal for a vocal booth. In the case of a live recording studio, you might have a vocal booth just so that you can isolate the vocalist while the rest of the band is recording live and have everyone playing together and the vocalist singing at the same time. So these smaller isolation rooms, it's important to know that they don't have necessarily the best acoustics, but they serve a really important purpose, which is to isolate the instrumentalist or the vocalist from the rest of the band. All right, now that we understand sort of the limitations of a vocal booth and knowing that, you know, this myth that, oh, a vocal booth is how we get great, great acoustics and great sounding vocals. And now that we know that, um, let's move on to understanding a little bit about how acoustic treatment works in our vocal booth so that you can understand how to then design the perfect acoustic treatment for your vocal booth. So the primary way we are going to absorb frequencies in our vocal booth is through insulation. This is a cheap and effective material at absorbing sound waves. And the main insulation I usually recommend um, are Knopf Ecos insulation, uh, Owens Corning Thermofiber is another great one, and then Rockwool Safe and Sound. Even though I don't recommend it for isolation purposes, it's actually a really good resource for using it for acoustic panels inside of your recording studio or vocal booth. You can also use Corning's uh, Owens Corning 703, which is kind of the industry standard for absorptive acoustic panels, but I tend to stay away from it these days because it has formaldehyde, and I'm trying to lean towards a more green building approach with everything I do. For that reason, I'm sticking more to mineral wool based materials like the Knopf Ecos, um, the, which is formaldehyde free. It may still be uh, mineral glass fiber based, but it's at least doesn't have the formaldehyde and it's got higher green standards, and then the safe and sound and the thermofiber, which is basically uh, Owens Corning version of the com competitor to uh, Rockwell safe and sound. So to understand why we use insulation, we just really want to have a fundamental understanding of how insulation works as an acoustic panel. So it's not too complex, but essentially the reason that insulation works so well is because you have all these minuscule tiny fibers that the sound must pass through as it's traveling through the insulation. And as the sound waves are traveling through those that web of fibers in there, uh, a lot of the friction that's created turns those sound waves into heat, thus absorbing the sound, making it so we don't hear the reflection of the sound bouncing back into the room. 
So that is the fundamental physics of how insulation panels work. And it's one of the main reasons why we use them because they're cheap, affordable, and effective. However, there are some limitations. When it comes to lower frequencies, specifically below 125 hertz, it's extremely hard to get full 100% absorption with just insulation panels. However, there is a way to do this, and there's several different factors that affect how efficient our insulation panels are. So the first thing I'll say is that the Master Handbook of Acoustics has a great little chapter on absorption where they talk about the thickness of your insulation panel and how that will affect um, the absorption. So the 125 hertz that I was mentioning earlier, that is actually directly from the Master Handbook of Acoustics where they say that a four inch panel of you know fiberglass insulation or mineral wool with three pounds per uh, cubic foot of density will have nearly 100% absorption down to 125 hertz, which is really great. Um, that is actually very, very good for an uh, insulation panel. Now, the high to mid frequencies are easy. Those are easy to absorb. Pretty much any insulation or foam panel on the market will absorb maximally in the mid to high frequencies above you know that 125 to 250 hertz range it's when we get down to those lower frequencies that things get really tricky now now that you know that you might be asking okay well then how low do we need to go if i'm just treating like a male voice so according to an article written by michael miller on the male voice the fundamentals of the male voice usually go down to about 85 to 180 hertz so somewhere in that range, depending on if you're, you know, a lower, have a lower voice or sort of a higher male voice. Female voices tend to be higher, so we're kind of focusing on the male voice just so we know the, the lowest that we're trying to absorb in this vocal booth. However, he also says that professional bass singers can hit all the way down to 40 hertz. So if you're dealing with professional bass singers in your studio, you know that that could be an issue if you're trying to absorb down to 40 hertz. So now that we know generally where the voice sits in the frequency spectrum on the low end, next let's talk about another tool that will help us get lower than 125 hertz, and that is the quarter wavelength rule. Now the quarter wavelength rule is an acoustical property that helps us understand that when you have an insul piece of insulation acoustic panel, the farther you move it away from off the wall, the better it will absorb low frequencies. And to be specific, if you move it a quarter of a wavelength distance from the wall, it will maximally absorb at that frequency's quarter wavelength. So let's put this into an example so you can understand what I'm talking about and learn how to calculate this on your own. So first, the wavelength of a sound wave is determined by the formula wavelength equals velocity divided by that frequency. Now the velocity is going to be the speed of sound, and the speed of sound varies based on temperature, humidity levels, things like that, but as a general rule for acoustics, what we do is we estimate it to be roughly around 1,125 feet per second, or 343 meters per second. So simply for a frequency of 100 hertz, what we would do is we take that 1,125 feet per second, divide that by 100, and that will give us 11.25 feet. So that is gonna be the full wavelength of a 100 hertz wave. Now to get the quarter wavelength, all we have to do is take that 11.25 feet and divide it by four. That comes down to 2.81 feet. So roughly three feet off of the wall will maximally absorb at 100 hertz. Now, as you understand, losing three feet of space in your already tiny vocal booth is not practical. And herein lies the problem with acoustics in smaller spaces. To maximally absorb down to lower frequencies, we really need the space behind the panels to help us absorb into that lower frequency range. So small rooms by their nature are gonna be limited in how much absorption we can actually achieve. All right, now that we understand that four inches of mineral wool insulation will give us a strong 125 hertz maximal absorption and that we have this tool called the quarter wavelength tool to help us understand how far off our panels can come from the wall and how that helps us with low frequency absorption now let's talk about the design approach for a vocal booth and how we can maximize 
low frequency absorption with such small amounts of space. So we know that we have these constraints. So we're going to have to make some sacrifices when designing our vocal booth. And that's just the nature of it. There's nothing wrong with that. And we make sacrifices all the time when we're designing studios. We just may not realize it. So basically, what I do when I'm designing a vocal booth for a client is I try to decide how much space are they willing to give up for the acoustic treatment, and then I design after that. I also try to figure out if I can use the corners to help me get lower frequency attenuation by using the quarter wavelength rule, which gives us, when a panel is straddling a corner, that'll give us more space behind the insulation, thus increasing the low frequency absorption. So, for example, with this client that I have right now, we're building a vocal booth in his closet, and it's already a fairly small space. So I'm tending to use two by four um, wood to frame out my acoustic walls and ceiling. And then I'm gonna put something like rock wool safe and sound into the two by four structure and then cover it with acoustic fabric. And this is usually like a Guilford of Maine acoustic fabric if we have the budget, or it could be something like a local fabric store that has something that's breathable. Now, if I can get further off the wall than that three and a half inches of insulation, then I'm gonna increase my low frequency absorption. So the two main places that I usually try to do that are gonna be in the corners of this closet and then also with the ceiling. If I can lower my ceiling cloud, as it's usually called, down and still have some enough head height in the room to feel like a comfortable space to sing vocals, I'll get some more low frequency absorption in that small vocal room. So in conclusion, as you can see, there's a lot that goes into designing a vocal booth and the acoustics of a vocal booth are particularly challenging because of the limited space we have to begin with. However, I still recommend going as thick as you can up to that four inch marker with your insulation. You can go thicker than four inches of insulation, but remember four inches is gonna be great. And then you can also increase the air gap behind that insulation if you have the space. I recommend using a mineral wool based insulation if you can, or a formaldehyde free insulation just for the health benefits. Remember that you're gonna use the quarter wavelength rule to understand how far off the wall you can get your panels and what the maximum amount of absorption will be. As a side note, it's important to remember when I say these maximum numbers of absorption, remember you're still getting absorption down to lower frequencies, it's just not 100% maximal. It just means that you're getting a less efficient absorption rate at lower frequencies based on the quarter wavelength rule. Lastly, some of you may be saying, oh, this guy has no idea what he's talking about because he hasn't even mentioned pressure-based traps. Now, you would be right to understand that a pressure-based trap, meaning a trap that does not use insulation but primarily creates a concealed box there where a pressure builds up inside of that box to absorb lower frequencies, that is a great and effective means of absorbing lower frequencies, but it's extremely inefficient and it takes up a ton of space. When I say it's inefficient, it means it has a very narrow Q, which for those of us who use equalizers, that means that your bell curve is very narrow, meaning that you're only absorbing that frequency at a small range, usually within a 10 Hertz range of the optimum frequency of absorption. So this is not great if you're trying to absorb broadband low frequency absorption. The other thing is that to build these traps, you still need, you know, four to four by four feet of square footage on your wall or your ceiling and again that's taking up a lot of space to give you very narrow absorption which is then taking away from the broadband absorption which then means that you have a non-linear or flat absorption response in your vocal booth which can which can actually cause more problems than solve problems in the long run so that's my spiel on pressure-based traps and you can always watch more of my videos to understand how pressure-based traps work. All right, I hope you've enjoyed this vocal booth series. I hope it's opened your eyes to the pros and the cons of vocal booths and the limitations you have with acoustic treatment, but also how to overcome those limitations and still get a great sounding room in a small space. Once again, if you're on this journey, check out that free acoustic treatment guide. You can download it right away at soundproofyourstudio.com acoustic. That is soundproofyourstudio.com slash acoustic. I'll see you all next week with more information on soundproofing and room acoustics.